The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Chapter 10, Part 4. Solitary prisoners are to keep silent. I sat on the cot, opened the Gospel of John, and read until the ache in my heart went away. Two days after my birthday, I was taken for the first time to the big, echoing shower room. A grim-faced guard marched beside me, her scowl forbidding me to take pleasure in the expedition. But nothing could dim the wonder of stepping into that wide corridor after so many weeks of close confinement. At the door to the shower room, several women were waiting. Even in the strict silence, this human closeness was joy and strength. I scanned the faces of those coming out, but neither Betsy nor Nolly was there, nor anyone else from Harlem. And yet, I thought they were all my sisters. How rich is anyone who can simply see human faces? The shower, too, was glorious. Warm, clean water over my festering skin, streams of water through my matted hair. I went back to my cell with a new resolve. The next time I was permitted a shower, I would take with me three of my Gospels. Solitary was teaching me that it was not possible to be rich alone. And I was not alone much longer. Into my solitary cell came a small, busy black ant. I had almost put my foot where he was one morning as I carried my bucket to the door when I realized the honor being done me. I crouched down and admired the marvelous design of legs and body. I apologized for my size and promised I would not so thoughtlessly stride about again. After a while, he disappeared through a crack in the floor. But when my evening piece of bread appeared on the door shelf, I scattered some crumbs, and to my joy, he popped out almost at once. He picked up a heroic piece, struggling down the hole with it, and came back for more. It was the beginning of a relationship. Now, in addition to the daily visit of the sun, I had the company of this brave and handsome guest. In fact, soon of a whole small committee. If I was washing out clothes in the basin or sharpening the point on my homemade knife when the ants appeared, I stopped at once to give them my full attention. It would have been unthinkable to squander two activities on the same bit of time. One evening, as I was crossing another long, long day from the calendar scratched on my wall, I heard shouts far down the corridor. They were answered closer by. Now noisy voices came from every direction. How unusual for the prisoners to be making a racket. Where were the guards? The shelf in my door had not been closed since the bread came two hours ago. I pressed my ear to it and listened, but it was hard to make sense of the tumult outside. Names were being passed from cell to cell. People were singing, others pounding on their doors. The guards must all be away. Please, let's be quiet, a voice nearby pleaded. Let's use this time before they get back. What's happening, I cried through the open slot. Where are the guards? At the party, the same voice answered me. It's Hitler's birthday. Then these must be their own names people were shouting down the corridor. This was our chance to tell where we were, to get information. I'm Corey Ten Boom, I called through the food shelf. My whole family is here somewhere. Oh, has anyone seen Casper Ten Boom? Betsy Temboom, Nolly Van Overden, Wilhelm Temboom. I shouted names until I was hoarse and heard them repeated from mouth to mouth down the long corridor. I passed names too to the right and left as we worked out a kind of system. After a while, answers began to filter back. Mrs. Van Der Elst is in cell 228. PJ's arm is much better. Some of the messages I could hardly bear to relay. The hearing was very bad. He sits in the cell without speaking. To my husband, Joost, our baby died last week. 
along with personal messages, were rumors about the world outside, each more wildly optimistic than the last. There is a revolution in Germany. The Allies have invaded Europe. The war cannot last three weeks longer. At last, some of the names I had shouted out began to return. Betsy Tenboom is in cell 312. She says to tell you that God is good. Oh, that was Betsy. That was every inch Betsy. Then, Nolly Van Worden was in cell 318, but she was released more than a month ago. Released. Oh, thank God. Two's two released. News from the men's section was longer returning, but as it did, my heart leapt higher and higher. Peter Van Worden released. Herman Slurring released. Wilhelm Tenboom released. As far as I could discover, every single one taken in the raid on the Baye, with the exception of Betsy and me, had been freed. Only about father could I discover no news at all although I called his name over and over into the murmuring hall. No one seemed to have seen him. No one seemed to know. It was perhaps a week later that my cell door opened and a prison trustee tossed a package wrapped in brown paper onto the floor. I picked it up, hefted it, turned it over and over. The wrapping paper had been torn open and carelessly retied. But even through the disarray, I could spot Nolly's loving touch. I sat on the cot and opened it. There, familiar and welcoming as a visit from home, was the light blue embroidered sweater. As I put it on, I seemed to feel Nolly's arms circling my shoulders. Also inside the package were cookies and vitamins, needle and thread, and a bright red towel. How Nolly understood the gray color hunger of prison. She had even wrapped the cookies in gay red cellophane. I was biting into the first one when an inspiration came to me. I dragged the cot out from the wall to stand under the naked overhead bulb. Climbing on it, I fashioned a lampshade with the paper. A cheery red glow at once suffused the bleak little room. I was rewrapping the cookies in the brown outer paper when my eyes fell on the address written in Nolly's careful hand, slanting upward toward the postage stamp. But Nolly's handwriting did not slant. The stamp. Hadn't a message once come to the Bay A under a stamp? Penciled in the tiny square beneath. Laughing at my own overwrought imagination, I moistened the paper in the basin water and worked the stamp gently free. Words! There was definitely writing there, but so tiny, I had to climb again onto the cot and hold the paper close to the shaded bulb. All the watches in your closet are safe. Safe. Then, then, you see, and Hank and Mary and... They got out of the secret room. They'd escaped. They were free. I burst into racking sobs, then heard heavy footsteps bearing down the corridor. Hastily, I jumped down from the cot and shoved it back to the wall. The pass-through clattered open. What's the commotion in there? It's nothing. I, I won't do it again. The slot in the door snapped shut. How had they managed it? How had they got past the soldiers? Never mind. Dear Lord, you were there. And that was all that mattered. The cell door opened to let in a German officer, followed by the head matron herself. My eyes ran hungrily over the well-pressed uniform with its rows of brilliant colored battle ribbons. Miss Tenboom, the officer began in excellent Dutch. I have a few questions I believe you can help me with. The matron was carrying a small stool, which she leapt to set down for the officer. I stared at her. Was this obsequious creature the terrible-voiced terror of the woman's wing? 
The officer sat down, motioning me to take the cot. There was something in that gesture that belonged to the world outside the prison. As he took out a small notebook and began to read names from it, I was suddenly conscious of my rumpled clothes, my long, ragged fingernails. To my relief, I honestly did not know any of the names he read. Now I understood the wisdom of the ubiquitous Mr. Smith. The officer stood up. Will you be feeling well enough to come for your hearing soon? Again, that ordinary human manner. Yes, I, I hope so. The officer stepped into the hall, the matron bobbing and scurrying after him with the stool. It was the 3rd of May. I was sitting on my cot sewing. Since Nolly's package had been delivered, I had a wonderful new occupation. One by one, I was pulling the threads from the red towel and with them, embroidering bright figures on the pajamas that I had only recently stopped wearing beneath my clothes. A window with ruffled curtains, a flower with an impossible number of petals and leaves. I had just started work on the head of a cat over the right pocket when the food shelf in the door banged open and shut with a single motion. And there on the floor of the cell lay a letter. I dropped the pajamas and sprang forward. Nolly's writing. Why should my hand tremble as I picked it up? The letter had been opened by the censors, held by them too. The postmark was over a week old, but it was a letter, a letter from home, the very first one. Why this sudden fear? I unfolded the paper. Corey, can you be very brave? No, no, I couldn't be brave. I forced my eyes to read on. I have news that is very hard to write you. Father survived his arrest by only 10 days. He is now with the Lord. I stood with the paper between my hands so long that the daily shaft of sunlight entered the cell and fell upon it. Father, Father, the letter glittered in the crisscross light as I read the rest. Nolly had no details, not how or where he had died, not even where he was buried. Footsteps were passing on the coconut matting. I ran to the door and pressed my face to the closed pass-through. Please, oh please, the steps stopped. The shelf dropped open. What's the matter? Please, I've had bad news. Oh, please don't go away. Wait a minute. The footsteps retreated, then returned with a jangle of keys. The cell door opened. Here, the young woman handed me a pill with a glass of water. It's a sedative. This letter just came, I explained. It says that my father, it says that my father has died. The girl stared at me. Your father, she said in astonished tones. I realized how very old and decrepit I must look to this young person. She stood in the doorway a while, obviously embarrassed at my tears. Whatever happens, she said at last, you brought it on yourselves by breaking the law. Dear Jesus, I whispered as the door slammed and her footsteps died away. How foolish of me to have called for a human help when you were here. To think that Father sees you now, face to face. To think that he and Mama are together again, walking those bright streets. I pulled the cot from the wall, and below the calendar scratched another date. March 9th, 1944. Father, released. And we'll continue with the hiding place. In the next video. Till then, thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. Bye-bye.